Central. This person that I'm talking is Dr. Robert Barry Kirstein. And if you guys remember the lecture for Dr. Ben Soto, he uh, was telling us that he was the person that uh, developed the concept of DTR. Also, that he was a part of the developers of the T-Scan, and he's been involved with this company for 30 years. Uh, so I have the opportunity to, in this break session, I call him and I say, okay, Robert, this is the situation. I apologize because I, we didn't invite you in the first place. I met him in, in Spain five years ago, an amazing speaker, and honestly, the content is fantastic. So this is the news, the surprises that we have. What we didn't define is, is he's going to be with us tomorrow at 1 or at 6 p.m., but of course, we're going to have him, and he's going to talk something really amazing that Dr. Ben recommends us to uh, pay attention to it, that is the neurophysiology of the PDF and the relation with the muscles. So we will discuss more about this, but um, anyway, so stay tuned. Also, he's going to be part of the marathon. Apparently, the marathon, we're going to run it for half an hour more. So more paper, toilet, and water, important for uh, the armamentarium. Okay, so now let's get into the subject. We're excited to have my great friend, Jeff McClendon. Uh, Jeff is... Uh, a crazy guy. I love him. I use the word like uh, we are the inappropriate <laughs> kids into our net group, but my wife say, don't use the word inappropriate. Use the more adventurous guys. So we are the more adventurous guys into this group, and we have a lot of fun. We always try to make the best for every single thing and develop a really uh, close relationship. And I like him pretty much. I call him the lips guy. Just because you see his lecture, big part he put a lot of input about the orbicular disorders and the buccinator. But not just that, uh, this is what we call the buccal slim, right? But not just that, also into the nemotech, when we were, uh, I worked with them in software development, he put a really nice feature into the facial analysis that is what we call morphine of the lips. Did you guys remember when we were talking about? digital planning for maxillofacial cases. One of the, uh, the, the persons that was looking at the lecture, they tell us if we can reproduce the planning. And this is one of the cool features that we have. We can create what we call morphine that we can base in numbers, in the cephalometrics. Uh, we can make that soft tissue change because we take CVCT pictures, 3D pictures, and we, don't, we can do that. So the, the feature that Jeff put in Nemo Smile Design as a fact is something that we can move the lips because after that we make a rehabilitation, it's a fact that the lip never gonna stay in the old position. And since we want to do emulations, that is virtual trying. So Jeff talked to, to, to Miguel, that is the, the head be, be, besides Nemotech, and Miguel put this feature, and since then I call him the lip guy, and he's so amazing. So let me pass it to Hamid before I officially say welcome to my friend. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, Jeff, very great and, and uh, an honor to uh, meet you finally. I've uh, heard about you last three years quite a bit from Javier, and and uh, when we originally were talking about uh, this. Uh, this project, it was very important to us to, uh, to bring a few uh, prosthodontists like yourself um, into it for a long time. Uh, the point of view of prosthodontics uh, had been uh, lost to us, how you guys think and rationalize and, and basically uh, move through the cases. And um, in, in watching you and, and uh, analyzing your uh, previous uh, interactions with uh, Javier, it came to us that uh, there is actually, there's a lot of common grounds and there are a lot of um, good physiologic uh, uh, thought that goes into it. And that's that what in really interested us. And um, so I'm looking forward to learning quite a bit today as well. And I um, want to welcome you to here and, and thank you for being with us. All right. Thank you, and, and thank you for having me. I have all these notes here that I want to remember to say 
Thank you to um, Javi and Amid um, for this invitation to, um, to just join this experience. And um, it's been great. Uh, I guess I'm number 20 and um, it's been great for the first 19. And for sure, yesterday, Patricia in the morning at nine was um, just, um, it was worth being off for two months and up in the morning and just reviewing that sort of process that the child um, has growing and developing. I guess my presentation is supposed to be about perspective on bioesthetic dentistry 25 years. And what I learned was this idea, put the patient on a splint, locate the hinge axis, and then create this thing that Dr. Lee called the biologic model. And that's a, a real specific way that natural unworn teeth fit together in a class one cranial based to mandible relationship. And, and what, you, what you learn is, is that that's, an, that's knowledge. And that knowledge or information just creates a new question. And you ask, well, what about this? And why that? And so then you, you have to pay attention to what the orthodontist is saying or doing. And then when you pay attention to that, it's growth and development. And then on the other spectrum of that, you have the patient that's broken down and you have to figure out, well, how do I put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Well, the maxillofacial surgeon looks at the face and says, well, this is the way I think I'm going to put that all back together. Well, if you look at the way they put the face together and you go back here and see how great faces grow, in the middle there, you sort of see, oh, that's what they look like or should look like when they're 10 or 12, and then when they're 20, and when they're 30 and 40. And, and so this idea of bioesthetics or biologic model came from Bob Lee, Dr. Lee, who developed the Panadinic. You're gonna kill my entire introduction then. Are you gonna say it all in one second? Uh, no, I just was saying hi, and um, you know, I hope you like the bow tie. Yeah, and, I like uh, it. I'm just here to make you smile. <laughs> Okay, Jeff. Uh, thank you so much, honestly. Uh, you pretty much said all the objectives that we have with this uh, interview with you. As oh, a fact, we don't have much information about the concept of thinking of biostatics, and we definitely want to learn for you that I think you are an amazing uh, representative of the, the thinking process. You've been talking about it worldwide. and you and I, we sit and spend hours, and I think we enjoy this too much because honestly, this is feeling different corners of what we really normally do. It's still a fact that we do things different, but we're gonna focus in all the positive things because it that makes something really important. Uh, people is asking, what can be the best way to simplify this information coming for all these beautiful people? And then I will say, the most important way is see what is consistent patterns from them and then realize that maybe those are the important things to do. Maybe we argue for things that put us apart, but look how many things we have in common, even with different perspectives. So that means that that is what is building us up. Maybe that is the success. And we try maybe uh, just to differentiate procedures or modalities that we do that take us the, the, the perspective of how unique we are, how we complement each other. So that's the message of this. So at the beginning, tell us a little bit how has been this, because you as a prostorontics, uh, the foundation is, uh, is uh, really rigid and methodolic based in, in, in uh, scientific data but the evolution of prostorontics is uh, know what you, the way you work. So tell us how you start involving in your prostorontic arena an open mind physiological concept, then tell us what it is and give us a brief description so we can understand what you were explaining about the biostatic model and all that because it's something that we don't know. We want you to help us to educate the audience. Yeah, I, I guess my... my um... My simplified process is when I was in my training program, I, I, we had at Fort Knox, we had an orthodontic residency. And in, in, in the Army, I was in the Army, in the Army there was a residency also at Fort Meade, Maryland. And at Fort Meade, they'd learned Roth mechanics and Roth system. 
They had a SAM articulator and they mounted models. And then at Fort Knox, they learned all the different wet modalities of orthodontic treatment. My two best friends in the Army in the day, Bob Spiller and Tim King, were in two different programs. And so we just had this triangle of communication, always questioning each, what each other was learning. And then the Army had a big uh, occlusion seminar in 1989 at Walter Reed. And um, Ron Roth, Bob Lee, and a bunch of other guys from the West Coast all came and had an interdisciplinary two-day meeting about occlusion and treatment planning. And out of that, um, the videotapes for that, Doug Knight and I got copies because the Pross mentor at Walter Reed was our, his, Doug's mentor in his program, me and mine. And so uh, when I got out of the Army, I used to ride my exercise bike and listen to Bob Lee and Ron Roth you know, on video before I had ever met them. And then I just had the great fortune in life to, to meet them both. And so um, that, that's my quickest, you know, synopsis there. You know, I just in a short period of time got exposed to, um, and in that program at Fort Knox, we had DMD seminars. And uh, in, in those, um, the first thing, one of the first things I learned was rock about a rule of sixes. And, and then when I got out of the Army, the, one of the first things I did was take a Rockabato C-spine stabilization course. And so that was back in the early 90s. So I've been around all that sort of information forever. And then we started a occlusion study club in Manhattan with Bruce Greenberg, uh, Spiro Kondos, and Jay Levy. And one of the frequent members and speakers at that club was Peter Farrow and just to make a circle and Peter um, one of his influencers was Mike Mazzocco and mm -hmm. Mike Mazzocco and I were uh, we went to dental school together and we both were chemistry majors and we used to talk about thermodynamics and quantum mechanics and we said what is all this dentistry it's like ignoring all this stuff that, that that's real science and we're filling holes and it's violating all the stuff that we sort of learned in college to get a degree wow. and we just were frustrated by our dental education sort of and so out of that um uh, i guess the most important thing that that um from mike was that um we always used to say well you can read all this research but then you have to decide on what n equals one is because doesn't matter what the research shows, you have to treat this patient and you have to figure out individually, how is that biology and that system gonna react to what you sort of know is generally happens, but where's that patient in, in, that result, in those results? So, um, yeah, I guess that was... So I think the foundation for orthodontics has a lot to do in part of the open vision that you have because I think when we do prostorontics and we combine these orthodontic concepts, you kind of start seeing that things need to make sense. And exactly what you say, where you see an adult that is dysfunctional and you start seeing what a normal growth and development should be, it's easier to take decisions in the way that you're gonna reestablish the stability of that patient. So that I think is a big input. Yeah, um, and, uh, and just if I, I could add on that. So in that, experience then that's i met dara and doug knight at nyu when they were ortho residents and and then out of that i used to spend fridays in the ortho lab mounting models and making appliances and and from that came a friendship and also an intellectual pursuit that still is with us today and yeah. and then what doug uh, with from dr roth uh, then that became well you need to understand who Bill Arnett is, and you have to read facial keys because you can learn all this stuff about teeth, but you have to put the teeth in the face and you have to learn how to look at the face. And so then from learning how to look at the face and facial keys comes this whole new way to look at, oh yeah, the teeth are in there, but the face is there first in front of you. Can you, can you look and evaluate the face here? Can you look at it this way? And then like Bill says, you know, 
face airway bite, I, I can build a face around an airway and then I could put the teeth anywhere in that to support it. And what most of us do is we work backwards. We go from teeth. We look and say, well, how does it look in the face? And we don't even know what the effect on the airway is. Mm -hmm. So in, in the other, in the paradigm shift, when you go to face um, and you start to learn how to look at the face, then you start to see where, what the airway challenge is and you see the structural issues. And then, it, and then when you learn to fine tune the function of the jaw, the mandible to maxilla, you start to learn how, well, it's, it's such an amazing system. It's amazing. You know? Okay. Now, just for the audience, they start to start breaking this in pieces. So, the way that you describe is because you're totally an expert and you've been doing this, as you say, for 25 years. But let's start giving us a little bit about the foundation of the concept of OBI or biostatics. What is the norm? And then we start developing for there because you have the luxury that you have information coming from different sources. But let's start for the basic. What can be the basic part, and then, of course, as any other philosophy in occlusion, the more you get deep, the more to grab, and then the more deep you go in some arenas. But let's start for the basics. Let's say how you will introduce the, the concept of biostatics, of, at least for us, Hamid and I, that we don't have much yeah. information about. That's, that's, that's a pretty simple thing to, to do. Bioesthetics is the theory or study of natural forms in function. And so, the, and, and so bioesthetics in, in OBI, we think about the bioesthetics of teeth. And some people could say biomimicry. But, but the, 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 the positive bioesthetic dentistry is, is that natural, is natural unworn teeth. And those tooth forms in function, fit and jaw function. And, and then that all is premised from the observations from Dr. Lee of patients that were 50, 70, 80 years old, that had little or no wear on their teeth, had little or no discomfort, and, and they looked much younger than a person of their same age. And he sort of said, why is that? And then the three principles then of bioesthetics are form of the joint, Form of the occluded dentition, where the, how the teeth fit together, not bite, form of the occluded dentition. And those dentitions, those dentate pieces, uh, parts of the system, they're all natural, unworn tooth forms. Okay. And in that idea then, there's a sort of, um, you know, you, everyone likes to do this, but there's about this two and a half to three millimeters of overjet, three to four, three to five millimeters of overbite at the centrals, more overbite, less overjet at the canines, and in a relatively flat occlusal plane. So not much curve of speed, not much curve of Wilson, a slight curve of speed. And then bioesthetics has four positions. The first position is the occluded dentition, which is teeth together. And then there are three test positions, and the they are in the at the incisive position. So you move out, you open and move out edge to edge, you open and move laterally to the canine tip, left to the canine tip. And all the envelope of functions within those uh, tooth component parts. And, and, what, uh, and, and from that, those observations mm -hmm. and, and data, uh, Dr. Lee developed the Panadin articulator. And okay. that articulator was then used to um, developed the, the um, chewing replicator for the study that Lundin and Gibbs uh, did at Case Western and then at the University of Florida to show uh, back in the, the like in uh, 1990 or er earlier how the fun what the function of teeth is and how we chew and what they developed was um, a an entire room of computers where they made two clutches and they had people chew food, different textures of food, you know, and so um, um, who's, who's our, uh, uh, the, 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 um, Francesca, mm -hmm. Michael Izio says, hi, Francesca. Um, 
you, you, what, what, what their research showed is, is that we chew different textures of food differently in different patterns. And, and, and people with different bits of their teeth chew the same food in different patterns. Mm -hmm. So we have unique, N equals one for cheese, depending on open bite, deep bite, malocclusion. You have different patterns. And what I'm saying is that is stuff that was published that, that then in the Panadan articulator, the motion analog, came from the research of, of people moving their jaws. So on other articulators that have, you know, that you can set Bennett movement inclinations, those are all mechanical surfaces. The blue blocks on the Panadan articulator are motion analogs, and they simulate real mandibular movement from real people. And then that was published in the journal Prosthetic Dentistry. So then the Panadan articulator is an evidence-based instrument to evaluate a mandible to maxilla relationship. It's really what we call it is a, is a jaw motion simulator. And if you once you stop thinking of whatever it, the instrument is that you use as an articulator, and you use you think this is a jaw motion simulator, then you find out whether or not the instrument you're using is allowing you to simulate the motion that you see in the patient's mouth and on the on your models and so the idea then is models mouth when they're equivalent then you have this you've captured the patient's movement movements and, and you can plan dentistry on the articulator if jaw motion simulator if you can take the individual care, patient's condylar inclination Bennett shift and and you Relate so that still all these features can be adjustable in that articulator. Very adjustable, and, and, and most important, what it allows you to do is, and some people don't like the articulator for some reasons, you know, most articulators are very hard and rigid, and, and the Panadent articulator and AD2, actually, the, they almost, I'm going to say, they almost flex. So the, so the, you know, bones have some flex in them, teeth are in a PDL, and all those little individual movements aren't in a rigid, uh, in an articulator, very rigid. In a Panadent articular, rigid, but it has actually, oh, it's like some people don't like it because it has a little bit of, oh, you can, on a first point of contact on mounted models, you can take the front upper member and you can, bend around that fulcrum and you can see really clearly what happens in the joint where, where, the, where, the, where the ball comes out of the analog. Now, that, so that's um, the ball supposed to stay in contact to the analog, motion analog. So when you have the ball dis displaced from the inferior surface of the, of the motion analog, now you have a distracted condyle and you have space that the disc can move in or move in or out of or an increased space. And so you can wow. use that um, instrument very visually and functionally. And, uh, and for me then, I, I, I've learned how to sort of like Alejandro yesterday, you know, Alex, you know, you do the surgery, you feel it in your hands. Well, in the, in the Panadent, you can feel um what that feels like as the teeth move and you can feel up in the motion analogs how the uh the condylar ball is moving on the motion analog so it's and i've been using that since 1994 so all those things that that i just described it's hard for me to feel and do those things with some of the technologies so i i like the, in my mind so far, I've, I've learned how to, I, I can feel in my mind what I feel in my hands. And, and then that's what I try to teach people in courses, how to use the instrumentation to try to feel what they see. And then Javi, with your tracking, you, you can see how it's moving, but what does it feel like? And so just putting it, but 
realizing that we have to be in a dynamic world that mm -hmm. contacts and in a, in a, in a set position, you know, then you have to really say, what is the purpose of having, what's the purpose of the fit of the teeth? You know, what's it doing or what is, or what is, what good is it doing? Yeah, God made anatomy for a reason, right? So I think they are done to, to have anatomy, right? That's right. And so what Dr. Lee, the simplest premise of biostatic dentistry is wear on teeth is sign of a problem. Now it's up to us as dental, you know, I'm going to say this uh, kind of, we, we created this uh, idea at, at NYU. We're, uh, with Jonathan Levine was program director. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the assistant program director. You know, we're, we had the DSD course with Christian in our office in Manhattan. And we've, you know, we in, included it into our NYU aesthetics program. Well, you know, DSD, we're dental smile detectives. And what we do is we use the smile and the display of teeth to start to be, that's our, we're at the crime scene. We're at CSI. And we're investigating data and we're use, we start with the smile and display of teeth to help tell us what's going on in the system. Why is this patient unhappy with their smile? Why are they uncomfortable with the way they chew? Well, we start with the face, we look at the lips and teeth, and we become dental smile detectives. And so I'll connect this part with the other concepts that Dara was talking about, posture, and the interdisciplinary treatment. How for you, because for her that she's an orthodontics is more like a orthodontic uh, planning because orthodontic cases go on in a long term. So you have time to change too many things during time. And as far as the teeth are moving, you start improving uh, posture and all that. In the prosthodontic arena, people are looking for quick resolutions and many of the cases they totally Distort, destroy it because the function and the anatomy is not correct. So still at some point we need to start building that anatomy back. We need to start making a rehabilitation of all the components, independent but with some level of integration. What could be that integration that you will do into your cases? What, what can be that process of connection uh, between the posture, the function, that a rehabilitation of the teeth as an independent units, and then it's going to be a part of a group with the dentition. And then you see, it start from the teeth by itself, teeth as a group, then teeth group with the joints. Now, how do you relate that with posture and all that? What can be your, your thinking process into that in, in interconnection? Yeah, well, that was kind of, um, I'm not sure if that was a loaded question or not, but. Um... I don't even know if that was English at this point, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Por seguro es español, pero inglés, Spanglish. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, um, I, I think in that journey that I was sharing with you, what you need to appreciate for me and Dara and Doug is that um, at the same time I was learning this bioesthetic idea, and, Ra and Dara and Doug were learning functional occlusion from Dr. Roth. We were all using a Penadent articulator. And um, so our instrumentation was the same. And our goal for tooth position, functional occlusion, and the test positions, as Dr. Roth understood what Dr. Lee was speaking about, that became the goal for his functional occlusion. This idea that there's these test positions and there's space in the posterior as this envelope jaw has this envelope to move in. As, as, you, as you do that uh, and, and you s learn that, and if you go to Dawson in neutral zone and you go to Bill Arnett in facial keys, you start to see that everyone's diagram for the face starts to overlap. And most importantly, where it overlaps is upper incisor display to upper lip with lips at rest. And what's the interlabial gap? And then ultimately, when you look at your CEPH sagittally and you start to do your planning, whether it's on models, and so you're doing hard teeth, or you're an orthodontist or surgeon and you're looking at your CEPH, you're still trying to treat the occlusal plane. And so if you ask Bill, you know, what's the purpose of all this treatment? 
to change the occlusal plane to improve facial balance, facial aesthetics, jaw function, and the airway. Right. To, and what and I emphasize is, that. And, and what most people do is they think that they look at the teeth and they miss the connection of the occlusal plane orientation in the face. And when it's too steep, that means that the relate the mandible, the plane of the mandible is too steep. And it creates a different load on the on the on the joint in the face. What is that landmark for you to establish the occlusal plane? Yeah, the uh, stomion, overbite over jet of the incisor, so that the lower incisor goes through stomion. The that line it becomes the occlusal plane, and then if you go really far back to rickets, you go back into the ascending ramus to xi point. Zy How do you relate that with uh, camber? I'm it, uh, I'm in I'm in a I'm a rickets occlusal plane to lower incisor to lips, and so I'm going to use that idea. No, just to have a visual for the people, like uh, can you compare and say they equal, they drop down. What is the difference between those? Because that's what people. If you, if you use the true vertical with the head in natural head position. If you use Spradley, if you you know, uh, and then to, to Bill. True vertical line, projection of lips, and then head natural head posture 90 degrees. Then we have 92 to 96 degrees occlusal plane inclination in, in, in the face and sagittal. And, and that, and, and that um, how does that play out? Um, Alex said it a little bit yesterday, you know, when, when, when he wanted to have that one and a half millimeters of overbite in the molars in the posterior. Well, you can't. Get that if there's no form on the teeth. Of course. To right. get that, that was where my question was coming. And then to have that form in the back, if the occlusal plane's too steep, the overbite in the anterior has to be too great to have an, a space for the mandible to posture and move in. Yeah. So you so now I go back trying to put things together that I learned. So then I go back to Hanau's Quint. And what are the five things that influence setting denture teeth? What are the variables? Condylar inclination, anterior guidance, plane of orientation, cusp height, curve of speed. You can't control the condylar inclination. You can only, you have, this is your separator in the front across the plane of occlusion. And now, it's something uh, that you yeah. say that I want to go in. Because you have the tendency to say, do you say that you have the tendency to make occlusal plane that they more flat, no more Wilson curve, no more speaker. How you deal in with natural anatomy? Because you know, when uh, to me that I live in a digital world, I found that the cases with more flat occlusal plane, you have more interferences with the lingual cast mostly. And then some of what I'm planning the case, that forced me to reduce the Wilson curve because I cannot kind of have this because in lateral excursions, I'm banging, banging into the surfaces. Now, the case vary depends on the jaw relationship between the, the way that the, pa, the, the patient is gonna make the two in cycle patterns. So what is your experience in reference to the anatomy of the tooth, because is the, it, still you can have natural anatomy, but doesn't necessarily mean deep anatomy, right? So what can be that, that how you describe your anatomy uh, based in the prostodontic phase? Because uh, I think that is when we have that limitation, we want to resemble what is natural, but still we need to create something that is still stable for the principles of the occlusal plane in the way that you, you do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the challenge there is, and I guess, um, you know, um, f from a long time ago, from the Army, and then with Dara and Doug, um, and we, um, posture of the whole body matter. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 um, the occlusal plane is only relative to everything else. And what you can't do is just measure it. And what you can't just do is measure the anterior overbite. 
all those things are in a in a big feedback loop and and sometimes any one of those values can throw everything off and so what what i what um one of the coolest things that i show or that well that you can demonstrate with a pen and end articulator mm -hmm. is you can take these idealized you know class one cranial based mandible teeth that fit class one and you move them to the test positions and you see what the posterior space is for your do you have interferences well in that relationship of unworn teeth in a good arch form with with this overbite that i described hobby remember four millimeters yeah so now so what happens is if you have four millimeters of overbite and you go up to the to the motion analog and you loosen it and you set it flat so you've had condylar resorption you've got a flat eminence and so your your angle is very very shallow you can open move the models to the test position to the incisive position you can move laterally left and right and you won't have a posterior interference but you have to have four millimeters of overbite at the central and then for the for it to clear laterally without anterior tooth contact, you need two to three millimeters of overjet, and you need five millimeters at the canine. That means that your canine has to really have a tip on it, and that tip has to go like that, and go like that, to go like that. Now, can everybody have that? Well, if they're their biology has to be able to take it. And some people, you may have to do what? Jaw surgery, ortho restorative. But you use the form for diagnosis and treatment planning. And when you get stuck in problems where I'm having interferences in the back, I go back out to the front and say, how much more overbite can I get lateral for a more vertical chewing uh, uh, envelope? And, and I have to harmonize function and aesthetics. And what we, Jonathan and I came up with this idea of the feline, the functional aesthetic edge. And what we do is a functional aesthetic evaluation of the buccal cusp to the incisal edge. And that feline um, tells you what the integration of function and aesthetics are. It's natural, it's worn a bit, it's severely worn. and that that range tells you functionally what that mandible posture is. And now when you, now you work backwards, how, how much in overbite can I get in the anterior? Well, I, I, how far down under the upper lip can I bring my upper incisor? Aesthetics controls that. You, you understand? You yeah. You can evaluate thought... it aesthetically. But then when you, when you make this tooth in this position and you say, here's where the bone is and here's where it, Here's the basal bone, and here's dental alveolar bone, and here's the tooth edge under the lip. And you say, oh, this patient's maxilla needs to come forward, and the bone needs to come down to have the tooth there. So, Kokich, Spear, and Matthews, um, 2000, um, oh God, five, six, um, uh, uh, interdisciplinary treatment of anterior aesthetics. The first step in their process, and mine now, and Jonathan, and what we teach at NYU. Uh, and Mike Galizio, what we teach is incisal edge, lips in repose, wax it, you know, mock up on the teeth before you start. Just start the mock up on the teeth and see when the lips relaxed, how much incisor do you see? And then I go back to what did I learn? Coronaplasty bioesthetics. When you do all the work on the models and you think that everything's functionally right, the last step is, is when you know that the canines separate the opposite second molars, you make the centrals as long as the canines. That's function driving aesthetics. If you just go the opposite way, you say, well, how long does my incisor have to be when it's that long? Here's where my canine is. That is the only functionality I can have because for this aesthetic, I need this canine here. If I make the canine, now that's a fundamental aesthetic from Rufinock's textbook that the centrals and the canines are in the same horizontal line. And that is Bill Arnett's ruler test when he sets the maxilla, or evaluates the maxilla for, you know, where am I gonna put my three-piece maxilla? 
the two canines and the two centrals, where are they going to be? On what line? Not higher, lower, they're all on the same line. And then that plane, just like you were looking at a, a tabletop desk, you look, there's an edge of the table, and then from above and below, you see the top. Well, that's the occlusal plane. And so where is that line in the front? So Dara and I, what do we do? We see where is that tooth? Where does the canine have to be? And then can we get the canines in this relationship so that we have this functionality that creates this aesthetic thing? And we start all that in our design of our splint. We try not to allow the splint to be too thick buckle. Yeah, we will talk about the splint in a little bit. Okay. Um, well, I'm just trying to complete a thought. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just because I want to emphasize also into the spleen and the way that you take the bites, but first. So, just for the mechanical model, in, uh, I'm thinking now as a plan in the case. So, your case is technically has an overbite and overjet, so you're protecting your envelope function, right? Mm -hmm. So, you're playing into this game. Now, my question is, when you said in the case, is the lower incisal touching the upper, so they don't touch? No, the, the incisors contact. Mm -hmm. They contact yeah, how, without perimetus to the upper incisor. Okay, so they touch, but, but the inclination has some freedom for the envelope of function. They have to, there has to be this overjet or the system, there's not space for the mandible to move. Okay, good. Now, if you, have, if you have two, if you, if your incisor is too tight mm -hmm. and you have less than two millimeters of, of overjet, you, your, your system's at risk for chewing contact. You're, you're at risk for the mandible, for the lower teeth to just touch the upper teeth as you chew. The, okay. in, in the research from Lendine and Gibbs, they did not find forward chewing when they measured the, set, the incisor point in the sagittal. The, all, everyone chews vertically in this plane, and everyone chews in this coronal plane, everyone chews like this. The only place that we have this variability is when we open and go this way and back, we either go really irregularly or very regularly based on the dentate relationships on the final three millimeters in and out of the fitted occluded place that the teeth touch. So how do you relate the inclination of the canines? And I'm just touching this basis because I know that the principle of the magua appliance that we will discuss in a little bit is build up these canine guides, you know, to guide the patient. So how you determine the envelope into those canine guides because it's a fact that some patients they compress before they start making the motion. The proof is we have these patients with a deep bite, huge overjets, total breakage into the front teeth that you say, how the hell this patient grind the front teeth? If when he's by down, he's 12 millimeters behind, right? But it's Still, that is compensations. And I mean, now we cannot use the word compensation because what Rocabaro tells us, but this relation between the posture and the mandible envelope, they relate each other. So, how do you take this by registration? Um, what is your thinking process during the time? What you consider? And then we talk a little bit about the fundamentals of the MAGO appliance. Yeah, there's so many questions there. Um, I try to take as much as possible from you in, in short time. Yeah, I know. We're getting so just, just fill me like I'm a sponge and just ring me. Yeah. Um, the, um, if you read Dawson's textbook, the purpose of a splint is to locate the horizontal a stable horizontal axis to plan from. And interestingly, he wrote that it didn't, it, it, there wasn't any research that said that one appliance was better than another, meaning an upper or lower. Mm -hmm. Okeson writes that um, 
you know, lower splints might be more aesthetic. And I started all this idea of bioesthetic splint that, it, that it's an upper splint. And in OBI, we teach an upper splint. And then um, over time, it just seemed like if, if, if everyone's answer is upper or it's lower, you're not asking the right question. Thank you, Michael Gunson. You know, you're not asking the right question or you're just not thinking biologically enough. And then that created the idea of, I'm going to just say lip rules. And then ultimately, everything's just biology rules. You have to learn the rules of biology. That's why I really liked Patricia yesterday. The lips. We have to figure out the, the neutral zone from idea from Dawson is that the teeth are in a neutral zone between the tongue and the lips. And that's the biology. And the tooth ends up in this best place where the lips and the tongue muscle forces are balanced against the teeth. So we, 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 so when you have a patient who's two class two, I've found that usually a lower appliance is my friend more than an upper. And, and if, uh, and Dara kind of referenced this uh, last week uh, in her presentation, we, we kind of like um, now we sort of, um, we make a hybrid appliance sometimes. Some patients, it's like they've got an open bite and they're really back. And so what they have to do is they need an upper appliance. Maybe it's just from six to 11, that's an aesthetic appliance to give them back an incise a ledge display to their upper lip, that, that's the biology aesthetics there. And then you have to say, well, the lips want to try to seal. How do I create uh, the lips to seal? And if you look in Dawson and you see the diagrams, how the, the lip deflects depending on where the incisal ledge is, All and right. then that's a whole chapter. How do you determine where the incisal ledge is? Well, he built, they build it all back to where the lip is. The lip is the soft tissue muscle that will move if you move the hard tissue. That's what Bill teaches us. You, your hard tissue um, structure has a soft tissue response and, and aesthetic to it. And so what you don't do is design to the lip, you put the hard tissue in the right place so that the lip can be in the best place. So for a lot, so if a patient's really class two, and, and if the teeth are retroclined, I'm gonna try to, if you would do a wax up to try to get this relationship from that, you would need to go like this, that, and that in your wax up. So that's what we do in a splint. We make a lower splint and we procline the lower incisors. So from Mariana, from last week, we may, or was it she, a lip bumper. We, do, we make a, literally, the splint has tooth form in it, but it starts at the gingival margin, and it comes immediately forward like you would make a veneer. And what, that, what does that do, Javi? It pushes the lower fibers of the buccinator and the orbicularis oris more facially. And if the patient is skeletally challenged, short mandible, what you've done is you've created a hard tissue support to put the soft tissue back in a place where it should be functioning if the face developed well. So what, do we, what does that create? It creates then in that buccinator ring, thank you Mariano, Roccabato, it, it creates a, a different ring from the attachment of the superior pharynx constrictor to the raffe, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, the ring around. And so why can you expand the maxilla because the, 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 there is, the buccinator has room to move buccally because it was doing this too much to begin with. And so you're just, you're epigenetically moving the bone, the dental alveolus and the tooth back into the space it could have grown in if the tongue had space, if the incisor was far enough forward. And, and all those things bring soft tissue with them. And so when you have a patient that's really class two and you look at the face and you look at the interlabial gap and, and then you go to what Bill would teach you, you know, do you have quality of parts? If you don't have a great looking lip, don't treatment plan with it. Figure out what would that lip part be if it was really bioesthetic.
what would the real form of that lip be if I really had a really well-grown face? Well, now all of a sudden you have a bigger lip and then lower bigger lip. And now all of a sudden they, they come together. Well, now where they just come together, the rule of thumb is that's where your lower incisor should be, where your occlusal plane should start. And then when you do that, your lips come together as your teeth touch, and that is this horizontal. Now, in that, you have upper fibers, buccinate, lips, buccinator, buccinator, and the middle fibers of the buccinator are where? At the corners of the mouth, they aren't attached to bone, the upper fibers are. And so you have this, you, you, you just go back to biology, and then you go back to what Patricia did yesterday about what forms first, or what's the, what are the functional things that we learned, and then you go back to embryology. Which form first? The lower lip at 28 days, the upper lip, the tongue at 29, at 39 days. This is the, this is the lip that's supposed to, it worked first and it's supposed to find the upper lip. And then when it loses the upper lip, you know, we have a problem. Every balance. And then what does Mariana Okay, so you determine the vertical dimension. So let me start wrapping up because it's running out of time. Okay. So you, you determine your vertical dimension based first in facial aesthetics, taking a determination based in the display in the theater, and then you determine where that incise alleged need to be functional. Then over that, you're gonna position the mandible that we didn't, you didn't tell us yet how, but then your consideration for vertical dimension is you're creating an overjet and an overbite about two, three, four millimeters, depend. Yeah. Now, do you, do you want that answer quick, I guess? Yeah. When, when, you, mount, when you mount models, okay, when, when Dara and I mount models, when we started, when we evaluate a patient, we do it the same way. Upper model with a face bow, lower model mounted on as the jaw rotates the first point of contact and then it, either i do it the lab does it she sends the models out she, we have a technician in vermont she all she does is puts wax on the missing tooth form on the model on one half of the arch the other side not we call that a contrast wax up but what it shows the patient is here's the wear on your teeth here's how bad your problem is because when we put back the tooth form, you see what the dental compensations and dental alveolar compensations are around the growth and development of the face and airway. And now- So hold on, let me stop you there. So then you have this half and you wax into ideal form. Yep. That of course is gonna throw the buy off and that's why you show the patient and say, you see, you bite in this way because your surface is flat. Imagine that you have your natural anatomy. Look how this, it, it can change. I'm correct? Well, it shows you, it identifies the problem more and shows how they've already accommodated um, or adapted or m malaligned or changed alignment to try to keep their teeth together to brace to swallow. Okay. When you're doing the magua appliance, and you guys do it upper, and one of the principles that you describe is to establish the occlusal plane properly. We all have patients that they can't it, right? And then part of what we've been learning in these lectures that is part of my influence is, at least with Robert Walker, the importance of to have the temporomandibular joints aligned with the base of the skull. And I don't know if you, you get to see Robert Walker lecture, but it is a big chance of these joints to move. And part of his thinking process is try to bring the occlusal plane uh, relative to the temporomandibular joint, so you can have equal chewing cycles. When you have in, and we can, I, I don't even know how to standardize the amount of pain when we do digital planning that we can see occlusal plane canted, right? So when you're gonna put an appliance and if your attempt is to try to correct the occlusal plane, that is creating an unequal gap into the bottom. Because let's say that you realize that the patient you were canted like this and mandible were compensated with that cant. Now, if you want to put an occlusal appliance and it stop and you're gonna level the occlusal plane, now you're gonna have divergent contacts in one side. Is that, um, like uh, my question is I'm thinking right, that's how you guys do it? 
Um, I think my answer would be no. That's okay, not that's... what we are thinking. What, okay. what, what I think, what I think, is when I put a piece of plastic between my maxilla and mandible, if I can create enough space so that I can get, start to get the jaw, the mandible to posture happy, as opposed to unhappy, now I have a space to think in, and I also have a space to diagnose in. And now if I have a can't, if the patient has a can't, now I have to figure out, can I, can I, who do I need on my team? Dara, Jeff and Dara, Jeff and Dara and Mike, Jeff, Dara, Mike, Holly, Jeff, Dara, Holly, uh, Mike, and um, Gail. Do some patients need five or six people on their team from, and you know, then that became our concept, um, lips to teeth to toes, or lips to teeth to tongue, to throat, to thorax, to thigh, to the high oi. Oh, is this too many components that we oh. cannot forget about? No, that's right. So, when, yeah, but those were all T's. You got it? Lips to teeth to toes. T, 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 T. Ah. T. I'm from Pittsburgh, so I got to keep it, you know, either simple or corny so that, you know, I can remember it. So the, the idea, though, is, yeah, we're all connected. And when you push here, something happens there. You learn that from orthodontic movement. When you put a, a wire on and you put a force here, it transmits along the wire and it changes that tooth there. Duh, you change the head and, or you change the mandible and the body changes. It's like it happens on an orthodontic wire. It's just a principle of like action reaction. Yeah. Energy into a How do you take the bite? Uh, Jeff, tell us, how do you take the bite? Yeah. We need to speed up. You okay, That's I'm speeding up. Okay, I'm gonna talk really fast. Uh, it'll sound like it's Spanish. Um, <laughs> I uh, try to put uh, something in the front to be an anterior deprogrammer. And, and usually I'll put a cotton roll across the first premolars, not letting the front teeth touch for a first relation. They can sit on that for a minute or two. And then I either take, I usually use a, a DLAR mandibular guide shim. Have you ever seen one of those? Like a George Gage? No, it's a, it's a soft piece of aluminum. It's about, to 10 millimeters wide by 25 millimeters long. It's soft, it's almost dead soft. And it comes in 0.8 and one millimeter thicknesses and it comes with its own wax, sticky wax to put it together. So you can layer them. So you can have one, two, three, four. And so usually I take a one millimeter DLAR shim and I put it over the two incisors and, and you put it on, it, it, it bends and it creates almost the exact lingual contour that the tooth has. Then I have the patient gently close their mouth together. I put articulating paper back at the second molar and I feel if something touches. And I put shims in till I can pull articulating oh, wait, paper. Wait, wait a minute. So you're doing the wax into the front. You allow the patient to flow it up until they get the first tooth contact and then you feel the registration. And then, no, then I add, one, then I add another contact. And then I add another shim. I don't want the tooth to touch. No, okay. No tooth contact. I want to know how the mandible just rotates before it deviates or deflects from tooth contact. Are First you contact. doing this in the dental chair or a patient sitting up? Um, I take them to the bathroom, close the door, turn off the light and tell them, no. Uh, I do it in the dental chair with them sitting at about 45 degrees or almost upright. Are you and, manipulating the patient? No. The only thing, I, my manipulation is I hook the shim in, I let them close, and then I can put my finger sometimes on the shim and I say, slide forward, slide back. Slide forward, back, up and close, forward, back, up and close. And then I feel, and then they do that, they do that. And, I, and then what'll happen, they'll uh, do that a few times. Correcting their posture by any chance? Say that again? Are you correcting their posture? Or no, like I just let them posture? say, I, no, head, upright and I put the shim in and I just have just so slide you do, over you, so you do correct the position of the head it, the patient the, is 45 the degrees but, but. upright the little head you know things behind them and, and help, help, help and just keep their head still they slide forward and back on that little shim how much space you leave for the sometimes, sometimes though, for the 
if they're two class two, I put the shim on the bottom. And then from those ideas, you, the, the third way I can do it depends on what the patient, you know, you have to, it's like one of these, you know, if the two, the lower incisors too retrocline, none of those techniques are good because the proprioception is, is off the long axis of the tooth. So what, so on those, I put a little Vaseline on the facial surface of the tooth and I build a little wall, a composite, and then I whack, then I flow a, an incisor forward and I have them close on their arc, but I procline a, a, a flowable jig to touch the upper incisor, the lingual to the upper incisor. And then I check for posterior contacts. But I don't guide or touch the patient. I allow their mandible to show me where it is that day. Then when, I, when they have that position, then I take a closed bite record. I syringe polyvinyl from the distal of the second up to the incisor, go to the other side and back. And when I do that, I, before I do that, I take a small little curved suction tip and I mirror, I dry it, suction, suction. And then I put the syringe tip with a little polyvinyl with, with a tip on it and I syringe. And then the assistants, usually they wanna help it. No, you can't touch the patient because the patient's gonna react to anything that touches their lips or them. So what you have to try to do is not touch anything and try to get them in that relationship and not move from it. And then I record that. And then that's what I, then we mount that. And then that creates the next appointment that starts to drive usually a, a splint. Sometimes the, I have to take that record, mount the models, and we wax up the two upper incisors, the four lower incisors, to see what that relationship is, and then we decide, and then we decide how to make the, the splint. So we we and and we so then all of that. The first thing I do, or as I'm taking that bite record I just said, yeah, I start with my feline. Okay, how you you so you're applying? How you describe your appliance? It has anatomy into the posterior teeth, cause force relation. My, my uh, you know, my, I'm going to say the sp design of splints for me has evolved forever. And, and the first thing that, I, you know, hockey pucks are out and gone. And um, the original idea of biostatic splint was that, you know, that the, the acrylic was about as thick as the tooth was, and it was an extension of teeth and, and has form in it. And then, um, uh, you know, Invisalign came along, and patients really tolerate and like Invisalign, don't they? Have you had yeah. any patients that say, I can't wear these aligners? No, everybody kind of used it. They like it, their results. For most That's part, right. it's acceptable, yeah. Tolerable. And, and they wear them all day long at work, too, don't they? Yeah. And what's the biggest problem with splints? Compliance. So what I've been trying to do the last three or four or five years is, I've been trying to take an Invisalign aligner. Okay. And I've been trying to put triad, clear triad or flowable composite. You drill holes in the aligner, you sandblast it, and you and you wax up, bond up teeth on the aligner because the patient likes the Invisaligner, they wear them. Why? Because they're yeah. just they're just thin one millimeter extensions of their teeth. So figure out in the patient's, you know, jaw posture, where can I put an aligner in that meets my criteria of how I think the mandible should be moving? And because most, you know, patients that use Invisalign, they, they have a fulcrum on the back and, they, and yeah. their jaw postures around it. Well, for almost all the patients that I have for, on Invisalign, I sandblast, put two little holes in the back of eight, nine, and I build a little ramp on the lingual so that they can close. You put Vaseline on the lower aligner, they close into the flowable on the upper, and now they don't have to posture their jaw to, to balance. And All right. keeps their condyle wherever you want it to be. And so if you think that this rotation is good, and now, oh, I hit the aligner and my jaw shifts, well, right there, Build a little anterior contact. Yeah, but the question is: so in the in the appliance, 
are you looking for individual contacts into the teeth with a tooth form or just the front? Uh, how it is? Yeah, well, if, let's pretend I was just making an upper appliance hobby. Um, I'm going to try to create my feline. That's my aesthetic visualization of the incisal edge. And then the contact on the lingual is going to I'm going to, it's going to look just like marginal ridges on a tooth if, if I, you know. Correct. And, and, um, and then where are the contacts? Well, you're going to have these spaces back through the appliance, right? So mm -hmm. at your first point of contact, you got a little space in the front. So you can do this on the articulator and plant it, or you can do it in the mouth. You look on the lower arch of where the cuss tip is, mm -hmm. and then you go up and you say, this cuss tip has to have a contact up there. Mm -hmm. and so I go up to the splint up there and I either mark it if it's in the mouth, I mark it where it is, or on the articulator, I mark it. You take like a number two round burr, you drill a hole. You sandblast where the hole is. You steam it. You put bonding agent in it. You don't cure it. Then you take flowable, put Vaseline on the teeth, you put the appliance in the mouth. You, you start with anterior contact. And you, so you have, okay, here's where, this is my vertical, and this is my cord and back guidance. Okay, now I need a contact in the back. Great, close to you and have your contact here. And in the back now, have the patient open, take flowable composite. And then, now in that little hole that you drilled, just flow a little composite in. What's it gonna do? It's gonna flow into the tooth. It's gonna go through the, uh, uh, a liner, and it's gonna come out the other end. It's gonna be like a toggle bolt. Mm -hmm. And now, in contact, you cure it with a light. Now, what have you done? What's your goal for tooth contact? What's your goal for tooth contact when you're done with treatment? Do you have two flat surfaces touching like that? Or do you have two no, contact surfaces? Yeah. You have a point of contact. All right. So now, to adjust the contact, you just have to go where you've light cured, and you have the cusp tip on the bottom. And it's touching a little flowable up here. And now mesial upper, distal lower, you adjust that you have this contact from the mesial slope of the lower, distal the upper, and you've got your contact, just like you'd have on a tooth. And it's your real tooth on the bottom touching hard composite on the top. And what's that hard composite attached to? It's attached through the aligner, and it's bonded onto the tooth. So what's it doing? It's transmitting the contact, the energy of the contact, through the, the, the flowable, and it's touching the tooth in one spot like it would. Like it would. And, and then what do you do in a splint? Well, you just try to make all these contacts on, on a flat place of acrylic that's splinted over the teeth. And so what do you do with the aligner then? With the aligner, what you do is you sculpt out interproximally and you almost you can almost cut away almost all of the aligner because you don't want the tooth being not flexing because the, the tooth has to move in the PDL. You put the splint on and it holds the tooth. So you download the vibration of the contact through the PDL to the brain. And so all you right. always have to catch up. So what you want is the most natural contact and form in the mouth and so that's why i do this and so and then as a real more for that then the the ultimate cool way to do this is javi would be an all on four upper appliance or all on four lower i mean all on four meaning when you look at the aligner that that, that lasts like a c class right mm -hmm. it goes in and engages right. Well, do you think you need it to engage on every tooth in the arch? No. No. You need the two second molars or first molar, and it's a canine. And then you cut out all the, all the aligner on the incisor, going back to their face now aesthetics. If you've got a really flat nasolabial angle, and your goal okay. for their treatment is to bring their maxilla forward, well, now you leave the aligner on, you know? If they've got a really full lip and you put this in, well, it's going to push their lip too far forward and they won't be able to seal well and, and, and it'll throw off their biology. So you go back to, and you just go back to everything that Bill teaches us. How do you plan a face? And what you do is don't plan something that you wouldn't plan for their face. 
So you, you just use an aligner. And what I'm saying is the aligner really moves the patient along way more quickly. They see and feel much more what they're going to feel like than having anything that's over, you know, too thick, too, and isn't what your treatment's going to be. You know, the space that's there. You know, you, you, you're, you're never going to just treat one arch to the opposite. You're going to do both arches trying to create harmony of, of, yeah. of, uh, and, and take out a can't. And, and, and oh my then, God, this is fascinating. Honestly, it's beautiful to <laughs> see how we consider too many things the same way that uh, we see in, honestly, too many things in common. It's all this thinking process has good scientific foundations and, and I think it's all valid. Honestly, I'm so happy that we're able to see this because we don't feel that we are anymore. I think we have too many things in common that we pay attention and then looking for resources. I like the thinking process uh, into have the leaps included into the treatment. It's something that in orthopedics is right. really strong. Or fortunately in, in prostatics in America is not as an important. It's many cases that we try to talk about the principle of the vocal slim of Rocabado, insufficiency of the lip closure relation with patients with tendency of anterior open bites. And sometimes we don't take a, as a consideration those soft tissues. So this has been amazing. Uh, we can be talking for hours and we proved this over two years that we never even finish in uh, our conversations. So let's move to the questions. Unfortunately, we want to be forever here, but uh, we need to give it a little break to the people. So, Hamid, go ahead. All right, All right Jeff. You already have seen the, uh, the question, I trust, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, um, you describing your uh, idea of what occlusion is yeah. and who were your influencers. Yeah. For me... Let's see, I think I have four answers to that question. And, and um, I'm going to par paraphrase one of my teachers, occlusion is an asymptomatic patient. Mm -hmm. It's that, it could be that simple. And, and then we're done, you know. Um, uh, uh, um, occlusion is the comfortable, effortless smile and the thanks a, a patient expresses after they eat their favorite food. Okay. Yeah. And, and for me, um, also, occlusion is a breathtaking smile. What's the biology of that? What's a, a breathtaking smile? And you have to think, what is a breathtaking smile? That, that, that could show up on Friday. And is Google occlusion. And it's the blockage of an organ or a, ho a hollow organ or, or a vessel. And so really, we are a hollow organ from our lips through the tube. That's our hollow organ. And what is occlusion? It's a series of a plastication and communication to a Like, am I okay now? You're okay. We have You're just a technical okay. connection for now. We're not live. Uh, now we can keep up. Here we go. We record. Can go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, the factors, the stabilizing factors that you're thinking of. Yeah. Well. You know, the first clue is to look at what the lips are doing to seal. And then look at the head posture on the neck, frontally and, and then sagally. And look at how the patient's standing in front of you. 
look at their hands. Are they turned in, out, what, what, it, one shoulder up, down? And so, you know, I, I, I learned that idea to look from head to toe at the patient's posture forever ago. And I for sure, when I got out of the Army and I started practicing in Manhattan, I used to hang out with Harold Gelb and Michael Gelb. So posture and looking at the patient from the front and importantly, turn the patient around and look at the back and see what, what their scapula is doing. You know, from, from head to toe, the patient ha presents themselves to you. And your first, your diagnosis is done before you, they sit down. So, so you, you are looking at all those factors like many of our other speakers. Yeah. Okay. For, yes, and for a long time. Perfect. Um, let's talk about the diagnostic records. It sounded like uh, you are very analog. Um, let's talk about those diagnostic records that we're taking. Yeah, it's, um, I, my um, analog records are study models and my feline that I, that I do directly in the mouth. And I, and I do that mainly because when I do that, what it does is it repostures the lower and upper lips that rest them when you smile. And so you can see where the room is to put, you will see the soft tissue response before you try to plan it in software. And that was the conversation or the dilemma with Miguel was like, well, you know, you gotta give me this change so I can measure that and create a metric. And it was kind of like, for me, it was like, I have too much fun doing that with the patient and kind of in, involving my assistant, myself, the patient, and, and creating that process. But that process is gonna probably, when we get back from this, you know, COVID thing, that will be, um, uh, I will do that mock-up in the mouth. It will be digitally scanned. It'll go to Nemo Smile. We'll make swipe morph changes on that. We'll print a model to make an aligner to make a splint. And then oh, I, I don't- Just give me a second, please. I'm checking because I think it's Facebook. Just a second, please. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a Facebook is frozen. Shut down. So we continue because we're almost about to finish and then... Yeah, finish and then people can come back later to whatever you've recorded. Yeah, they will re... Okay, so... And then what I... And what we... And, and, and then cone beam scan, scan models, you know, ST, with a TRIO scanner and... Um, uh, we have um, uh, we have a yeah, milling that's... machine. Uh, we can do one day restorations or two hour restorations. I work in Manhattan in an office with uh, Jonathan Levine and Kellen Mori, Nina Sato, and Salva Salvatore Trentalancia, and we have three ceramists in our office, five technicians. We have six chairs, but we have an in-house lab. So um, I, I just have had the luxury and the the luck of a lifetime to 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 be able to bring uh, a look and decide. You know, how does my mock-up look? How does my here's the splint in the mouth and have dialogue with the patient and then review tooth color and all the. that ability you know that's just a, a whipped cream on a cherry on the on a on, on a great sunday yeah awesome all right so um talking about uh, or thinking about those uh things that you take and you did mention some of the instrumentations that you use like cbct and the scanners today do you use any other uh kind of uh, uh measuring uh devices such as emgs or yeah. Can you see yeah. our graphs? Yeah. No, my I I tr well, I trust. Um, I'm going to just say I trust the research from Lundin and Gibbs and the Panadin articulator to be my instrumentation functionally, and then aesthetically um, from Panadin in '82, but over in the Coist dental facial analyzer, um, 
we really like to mount uh, functionally with a face bow, but aesthetically with the Coist Dental Facial Analyzer, I created a, a different plate for that analyzer that we call the fee plate. And then 82 and, uh, and Panadent have created a laser um, system mm -hmm. for that plate to sit on. So when you put the patient upright and you put that um, plate in the mouth, it puts a laser on their face and you can orient the head with the laser and that becomes the driver of my head posture. And when I mount that model on the articulator, now I have the upper model mounted as if I was looking at the patient. And so any inner, innate asymmetry that exists there, maxilla and mandible, I have it mounted on the articulator. And so I start from that and then I go to the comb beam and I look at the, you know, for occiput C1, C2. I start to look at spaces. I, you know, I totally, you know, follow down through. Procabado. Procabado. In, you know, in our OBI Mexico courses that we teach, um, um, Edgardo Saralegui has gotten Susana Peterman from Mariano's office in Santiago to come to Mexico to teach in our OBI course there. So we have an extra component of, uh, um, Cervical spine uh, stuff from from them, and so um, yeah, we've had. Yes, Mario this is the only uh, appliance that you guys officially use, or is some other appliance that you guys? Yeah, th that answer is. But don't uh, stay too long, please. It's just because the only reason. No, I got it. I got it. I got no, it. it's because okay. I'm gonna tell you upper why. Appliance. Because upper appliance. That's it. That's what we teach. We teach no, just because, people. yeah, my, Mariano also do research with a guy from OVI in Chile, and part of what he says is in the way that they do the appliance, they don't have anatomy into the back because, you know, this research that he's doing in the alignment of C2 in relation with the middle pole relation, and part of what he's developing is he's expecting that the posterior part of the jaw change because the condyle shifts. He say, even in the biofunctional or crucial appliance that we do, he say, be careful because if you don't diagnostic that middle relation, eventually you're gonna lock the patient in place and you're not gonna have the chance to have that automatic correction. And as a fact, I did in one of the research cases that I have the patient when I saw the x-ray was all shift. Then I put flat, uh, just pivots into the back and the condas middle is correct. So that's the only reason that I'm asking you if it's another kind of design for the appliance, so. No, you know, what I think what I said before was, was that the appliance creates a space to think in. And then what you have to learn to do is, that the challenge of a lifetime in dentistry is to, is to go to dental school where they teach you how to fill holes, and measure bleeding gums and to learn how much more connected that is to the rest of the body and health and wellness and to realize, oh, I need to get more education. I need to know, you know, you can't stop thinking at the head of the condo. You can't stop thinking, you know, you, you can't stop thinking at the base of, of the skull and you gotta say, well, what's this connected to? Because inside this little thing here is this brain. And this brain's got to think. Yeah. That's what, the, yeah. that's what we got to do. We got to learn how to think with our brain. And we got to think how all this stuff works. That's right. All right. Awesome. Which question we are? We're because, at question yeah. five. Because you keep interjecting and keeping more, more uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. discussion into it. All right. Five. Uh, I think uh, you partially answered, but you do use uh, interdisciplinary approach. You work with several other uh, yeah. professionals. Yes, that's all I do. When I was in my residency, I was given an award that I could that I could include orthodontic treatment, even the simplest of restorative cases. I had a treatment that need. Look, we got a tooth over here that needs rotated. It's rotated. It needs realigned. Teeth in the right, the right teeth in the right place in the right timing to get the right stuff. Absolutely. Good thinking. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we're going to talk about the sequence of treatment. I think you have touched on it, but if you can quickly um, tell us about uh, <coughs> how you would go about once you figure out 
where that vertical discrepancy in the posterior is, as you were describing. Uh, walk us uh, quickly through. You get the uh, your appliance, you develop your your occlusion and your your uh, contact points, as you said, your stops. Go from there. Finish the treatment. Yeah, well then sometimes those treatments take some time because not only are we adjust in the splint, they're going to a physical therapist, you know, to 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 co-treat or co and 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 Dara and I do a lot, a lot of that. We do uh, do it in New York too. And and the um, uh, when the patient when we have a, a our our space to, to treat, then we decide who does what when and what's the sequence of form solutions. And so Almost always for me, we're gonna we're gonna correct tooth alignment and tooth form, and then we're gonna get those to fit together. And so what you know, and learning how, and so every patient follows the same process, same sequence uh, uh, of, of of goals. But some people need this you know form on some teeth um, before they start ortho. Uh, what I try to do in, in Invisalign is I try to put the form on the teeth if, to, to get my clin check. I, I take my mounting, I wax the teeth, uh, tooth forms on, I put it on with flowable composite, and then I make new aligners, uh, a first aligner, and I clin check that relationship and put aligners on, make a splint out of it, and wait till I get the aligners. But I try to treatment plan from having tooth form on the teeth that I'm gonna move. I don't wait till I'm done moving teeth on Invisalign. If I have teeth that are worn, I don't know. I'm not in the right place to get marginal ridges leveled. I'm not gonna have cuss tips all in the right place. So you, you, have, to, you, you have to plan, 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 and then execute. Great point. All right, I and think. And then, and then that's, that's what, uh, Javier is so uh, great here because he can help us with the technology and the flow of, hey, here are these teeth. Here, I can put these forms on. Here, I can put make these aligners. And guess what? We can do this all in the Nemo system. Mm -hmm. You can find yeah. other systems too. What I'm saying is we have, a, we have a system that we can do that in. We can, we can create, improve the forms, make the aligners, and put that all together and, and provide the care. And that's what our goal is you know, you know, going forward after, you know, the, the, this virus thing's over, you know, we, we want to be as digital in planning as possible, but, but, but making sure that our records are really biologically driven and our goals are. And, and so that's why, um, so that's- Now I understand better. That, that, was, that was really important. Now I understand better why we were talking before that you want to develop something digital. Now I have a more clear vision why and how, so. We will definitely be able to do something digitally for the future. All right. Um, next question. I think I know the answer because uh, obviously it was all quite a bit of uh, half an hour of discussion on this. All right. So uh, the question is that when do you consider facial aesthetics in your uh, treatment? It sounds to me like uh, from the very yes, beginning yeah. you were looking at the lips and the incisal uh, display and the gingival display and all that stuff. Yeah, I think um, that's the simplest answer. I felt really good about that answer about four months ago. I can't remember the issue of uh, facial pain, journal facial pain. Um, the editorial was, we need to treat pain patients like dental patients. Like, let's look and see what their dental problems are, and let's improve their dental, the dental things as we're trying to deal with their pain, and maybe we'll have better outcomes. And so what I'm saying is, it, it, the, the smile is, is the uh, secret to dentistry. You can only, when you're happy, you can smile. But the, but the heart tissue has to be in the right place to smile. Yeah. And so when you can't smile, you can't be happy, and, and you can't be happy. And when not being happy makes you sad, depressed. It makes you, you know, it, it takes away from your quality of life. So when it, it so, when you try to find what the best smile for the patient is, you're probably going to find out what the best function for the patient is. What you're and, really and saying is a beautiful smile. It's not just beautiful, but it's probably the sign of health. 
Well, the, it's the ultimate oh, sign of health awesome. is to have the most beautiful, breathtaking smile. The, 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 the face, this is so simple, Hamid. This is why Bill Arnett and other surgeons can do what they do. They take patients that are in pain, asymmetric, function poorly, and they rebuild their face. And the patients on the other side of it, they smile beautifully, they breathe well, and they can eat well. Well, what did they do? They put the incisor in the right place between the lips, they oriented the occlusal plane in the right place in the face, and they got the face proportional. So, and, and then, and so it's a, a smile is a function of the face. It's yeah. a communication, respiration, mastication, communication. Our smile is our ultimate communication that requires almost no energy. And so right. how important is the smile? Well, it's, it allows you as a digital or dental smile detective, it allows you to start to see what's deficient so that you maximize the smile. Awesome. Sounds, sounds awesome. All right. <clears throat> Now we're going to talk about the, the growth factors. I know we have that in there, and I know you said that you're not necessarily doing any surgeries and uh, of that. Do you, do you know anything about it? I'm sure you've heard about it. Yeah. You know, I'm going to say yes. I don't have, I've never had a patient that had to have uh, any LPRF or anything in the joint, um, but that experience with me comes from the periodontists that I hang out with who use that to help rebuild um, bone and tissue in trying to rebuild, you know, the dental alveolus. And so, you know, the, you can use those factors a lot of places in the joint because, you know, we're talking about occlusion, but when you need a tooth somewhere and you need bone, that's something that helps augment the biology and the biologic uh, response and healing. Fantastic. Um, and uh, question number nine is about the uh, noticing of the postural changes in your patients. And um, are, are you, uh, is this expected, unexpected, positive or negative? Yeah, it's only, it, well, it's expected when you, have when, you, when you, first you have to notice that there's an imbalance or a posture issue. So you have to first you have, you have to, to first have, take notice. First you have to have a a, 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 a metric or a skill your your checklist has to be to identify that to begin with. And then the simplest thing then is just with splints, no splint in, splint in, smile with and without splint, suddenly repeatedly people's heads change position and shoulders change. And you say, Well, why is that? Well, when you take well. You have to figure that out. And, yeah. and then depending on what you believe is going to Im, Im, impact what you do. But we smile. The lips go back. These go back this way because what? The buccinator pulls it back. The, the levator pull it up or down. Buccinator pulls it back. When you see a patient smile to their first molar, it's telling you something about how at rest that face is that their buccinator can pull back like that and they don't use the muscles on their forehead or around their eyes and their lip, this pulls back. That's conservation of mass and energy. That's first law of thermodynamics. Big time. That's Big right. time. That's when the patient licked the ears. They're so happy and they're so functional. <laughs> That's right. And they pay their bills. <laughs> Never mind. All right. Uh, question number 10. More of a philosophical question, Doc. Uh, when or do you think at all um, are these uh, concepts ever going to be taught in dental schools? Actually, he is. Let's modify the question. How do you strategically, because he's working at the university at the moment, <laughs> so how do you guys strategically and putting this knowledge into the students? Let's start from there because, I mean, it's a fact that you passionate you want the people to understand and do this, but uh, also you working in the university, you had the influence to influence 
a population. How are you guys strategically and trying to create this foundation into the student? Well, we, we, we try, at least in our aesthetics program, we try to get them excited about the, a connection between aesthetics and health, and aesthetics and airway, and, 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 and aesthetics and understanding biology and anatomy. And, and, and the, the, you have to have a purpose to learn something. Other, mm -hmm. If you can't put knowledge to use or to test, you, you know, if it's just an answer on a test question, you didn't need to learn it. When, if it's something that helps you learn how to evaluate or treat a patient, like Larry's presentation this morning, when you're learning all these systems and all these d diseases, connect them to the, to the manifestation of the patient. And so maybe those have to start out as electives and a few patients get them, but why would we teach basic science to a, to a dental student and then not show the usefulness of it? Why would we teach them anatomy and all these muscles and not show them how important it is to understand the buccinator? The mm -hmm. buccinator to the, constrict, to the superior constrictor of the pharynx, to, to their, that raffe, to the attachment to, to, to the base of the sphenoid and occiput. You know, th it has to have a purpose. And when you take something clinical that they learn and you go and you show them, here's how you use that with a patient, they're gonna wanna learn more. When you just have to learn, hey, look, the string was around that muscle, I know what that muscle is. It's not connected, just like, just like this purpose of this whole program. You're trying to make connections. And, and so, the, 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 you know, create good, long, deep, strong connections. And, and that's what the system doesn't do. It doesn't create a, a, a want or a need that you connect information with, with, with practice. Correct. That's the reality. All right. Question number 11. Uh, True. Is specifically. True. <laughs> you know what it is. No. What is it? The sequence of events in the joint, in your mind. What are they? What's happening? Are you, uh, uh, are you a rotation and then translation guy? Are you? No. Hey, baby. Um, you know what? I think um, especially because I, you know, I, articulators rotate and um, and and we use those I think on the articulator to get the models apart but gravity in the mouth is what separates things not you know on an articulator we use our hands when I'm sitting here right now my condyle is not seated it's not up into a position the only time it, it, it wants to go there or I think that it's supposed to go there is when I want to swallow. And when I swallow, I have some light contact. And, and if my lips, if the, if the uh, sequence of occlusions are in the right sequence, my lips are together, my teeth are together, my tongue touches my incisive papilla, my tongue lifts the roof of my mouth, and the biologic function to swallow, either in the chewing cycle or the saliva that's in my mouth, I get that little stimulus, synovial fluid happens, and I'm happy when that occlusal plane is at odds with that function of swallowing. Everything has to everything misaligns, malaligns, or tries to change alignment to try to allow that function to continue to happen. And so, what we have to do is be able to recognize that that lips together matter, that lips together teeth to get lips together teeth apart matters, and that how we function laterally and front to back matters and so occlusion matters but the series matters and we have a different series of occlusions whether we are speaking breathing or chewing and the harmonization of all those functions is really what our goal is for occlusion we oh you chew with that system well you speak with it and you swallow with it and you spit with it and you suck with it. And, but before you sucked, you suckled. So, breastfeed with those lips. 
Hi, <laughs> Jeff. I love you so much, brother. You make us an amazing time. We learn a lot, honestly. I think this is the, the first conversation that we really break to many different topics based on the foundation of your thinking process. And that makes me understand you better and, and now seeing how you guys see it. Because I'm hanging with many of you and then I, did, I, I knew a little bit about 